um, and in their nurseries. I'm also a teaching practice supervisor, so I support um, students who are training to be teachers of the deaf, and I am a, an author of some of the deaf education mesh guides, and I'll talk through those um, towards the end of the session and provide some links to those. And so I'm hopefully now going to share my screen um, and then I will go through all of the things that I hope to cover in this section. So let me just bring up my PowerPoint. So hopefully now, can you see my screen? Brilliant, yes, and you can. still hear me. So I'm hoping to look at the identification of hearing loss and why early identification is so important. The importance of early listening and speech and language development. I want to talk about the types of hearing loss, um, the degree of hearing loss and simulate a hearing loss for you to hear firsthand how challenging it can be for the children that we work with and then give you positive top tips on how you can help. So the aim of the session is for you to understand the importance of hearing in the early years, to be aware of the impact that a hearing loss can have on early listening and language and well-being, and most importantly, to learn top tips to make your practice more inclusive for children who are deaf and with hearing needs. So first things first, for the past 18 years, hearing is now screened at birth. So the newborn hearing screening program screens little babies either the day or the day after they are born. So a tiny little probe is placed in the baby's ear and this handheld device um, checks whether or not there is a response from the baby's ear. If there isn't a clear response, they're seen a couple of weeks later for another test of hearing. And then if a hearing loss is identified, they will be fitted with hearing aids. So I have had tiny little babies on my caseload as early as two weeks old being fitted with hearing aids. So the question is, so why is that so important? Why are we testing the day that a child is born? Why are we fitting hearing aids as early as two weeks? And that's all to do with what we know now about early listening. So we know that listening starts in the womb. At 16 weeks gestation, a baby is already beginning to listen. And at 24 weeks, the middle ear bones are fully formed and a baby's heart rate increases and movements change in response to music. And so by 30 weeks, a baby hears the rhythm and intonation of speech and can access some vowel sounds in the womb. So because we know this, we know that a child with a hearing loss has already missed out on these key week weeks of listening even before they're born. We also know now so much more about early brain development. So if we look at this for the first 12 months of life, we know that this is a critical period for developing the sensory pathways, for developing language, and for higher cognitive function. And if we were to draw a line at around three years, you can see how much early brain development happens before the age of three. So those key factors mean that the early years are so important for developing attention, listening, communication and speech and language. And it's really quite remarkable that now studies show that deaf children can have age appropriate speech and language by the time they're five, if three things are in place. And those three things are early identification, which we've just talked about, early amplification, the fitting of hearing aids. And the third one, which is why I'm so excited to be talking to everyone this afternoon, is early support. So practitioners in the early years can make a real difference to the access needs of deaf children. And I'd like to give you top tips of what you can do. But before that, I think it would be really useful for me to explain about the different types of hearing loss and the different degrees of hearing loss and give you a chance to hear what it sounds like to have a hearing loss. So there are two main types of hearing loss. So permanent inner ear or sensory neural hearing loss that affects the cochlea or the nerve of hearing. And then the second type is a temporary loss or conductive loss. And this is something that's really prevalent in the early years. So a lot of children will get a buildup of fluid in their middle ear in the early years, which is known, the medical name is OME, otitis media with effusions, and more commonly known as blue ear. And studies have shown that this affects so 80% of all four-year-olds will have had at least one bout of glue ear. So that's really significant, isn't it? It's a really large number of children. So I'd like to play you a little video um, to show you a little bit more about glue ear and what it is. 
Glue ear is a buildup of fluid in the middle ear and is a common cause of impaired hearing. Hopefully you're hearing that and getting sound. When sound waves hit the eardrum, it vibrates, which causes the linked bones to move and pass on sound waves to the inner ear. The hearing nerve picks up the sound waves and sends signals to the brain, allowing us to hear. So, what causes glue ear? The middle ear is normally filled with air and is connected to the back of your nose by a narrow canal called the eustachian tube. The tube is closed most of the time and only opens when you yawn or swallow, allowing air to move into the middle ear and therefore keeps the air pressure on both sides of the eardrum the same. If the eustachian tube becomes blocked or swollen, it can stop air from getting into the middle ear, causing a vacuum that draws fluid into the area. This fluid becomes thick and glue-like over time and prevents the ossicles from moving freely, which reduces the flow of sound waves to the inner ear and affects hearing. In most cases, glue ear clears up without treatment and doctors normally suggest a period of watchful waiting to see if it clears up on its own. However, if it does not go away or if it keeps coming back, your doctor may suggest an operation to insert a small tube called a grommet. Grommets are not a cure for glue ear, but help to bring air back into the middle ear, which improves hearing. The surgeon will start by making a small hole in the eardrum and draining away the fluid. The grommet is then placed in the hole, which allows air to move in and out of the middle ear and the ossicles to move freely, thereby restoring hearing. Grommets usually fall out after 9 to 15 months and around 30% of children who have had grommets inserted will need them replaced. So this is a chart to look at the degree of hearing loss. So sound is measured in decibels. And for the children that I talked about who have a permanent sensory neural hearing loss, their hearing loss could be of any degree, mild, moderate, severe or profound. The children that I was talking about that have the conductive um, or fluctuating temporary loss, their hearing loss will be mild to moderate. But that still can have a significant impact because it means that speech is muffled at a time in the early years that is so important for developing early language. So I'm going to give you an illustration of that by listening to a simulation. So hopefully you'll have some understanding that it's not only about speech being quieter, but it's about the sounds of speech being muffled. So let's have a look to what it sounds like to have a hearing loss of these various different levels. in the newspaper today that a new theatre is opening. Isn't it great? It sure is. What plays are they showing? I think it'll be the one we saw last year. Do you remember? Yes, I do. Do you want to go and see it again? The play is so good, it'll probably be worth it. You're right. It's always interesting to see if they do it in a different way. The director is relatively unknown as well. These new directors usually have a different perspective of things, too. We should see that play. Good. Let's ask some friends. I'll find out who's interested. OK. I guess we'll have some time to make a right? Of course they will not open for another four months, but I'm sure they'll start selling tickets soon. The next day we should buy the tickets. They'll sell out of time. Right, let's find it cheaper. I think what's really interesting about that is that on some of the levels you could hear the speaker know that somebody was talking but actually couldn't make sense of the spoken word because it was so muffled. 
And on this um, chart now showing where the different sounds of speech are, the challenge is that speech frequencies are at the speech is at different frequencies with low frequency sounds and high frequency sounds. And that then means that speech is muffled and unclear. So the, the NDCS, the National Deaf Children's Society, have said that it's children with mild and moderate losses. So these losses that often happen in the early years that underachieve. And that's because sometimes they're not picked up. So they will present as if they are hearing because they'll have a lot of useful hearing. So they will hear sounds around them in the environment. They'll hear a knock at the door. They'll hear the phone ringing and so on. But what they won't be doing is they won't be hearing the sounds of speech clearly. And that is something then that you can really help with. Although I started by saying that the newborn hearing screening program is brilliant because it's picking up children the day or the day after they're born, studies have now shown that the newborn hearing screening program is only picking up 50% of the children who have a hearing loss when they start school. And that's because a hearing loss can be acquired and a hearing loss can be deteriorating. And the bad news is there is no other test, so there's no longer a health visitor screen at around three and a half. So it really depends on professionals like yourself working in nurseries and early year settings to actually pick up if you are concerned that a child's not hearing well and get them referred and actually put in some strategies to help them to listen to and, and to access the spoken word. Listening when speech is muffled, as we heard in that simulation, will have a really negative impact. So it will impact the child's development of attention and listening and speech and language. And then in turn, that will have a negative effect on their well-being. So the three main challenges are distance. And to be honest, that's quite easy to overcome. So we know that the further you are from a the speaker, the quieter the sound will be. So the way to overcome that is just to get close. So if you're working with a deaf child who has hearing aids or cochlear implants or a child you're concerned about their listening and their access, be close to them. And that will give them a far better opportunity to hear the spoken word. The other is noise. Hopefully in that simulation, you will have noticed that with the noise that was going on, the chatter at the same time, it makes it really hard to listen to the spoken word. And we know that nurseries and preschools and early year settings and schools are really challenging listening environments. We've not only got to think of the sounds in the room, we're thinking of the sounds outside, in the adjoining rooms, in the corridor, um, the air conditioning or the heating and any sort of equipment. And so I'd like just to play you a very short clip now from the NDCS, the National Deaf Children's Society, alerting us to the challenge of listening in noise and some of the simple steps that you can take to make sound more accessible. As we all know, classrooms can be very noisy places and that can have a dramatic effect on a pupil's ability to follow a lesson. They have to just stop talking and then I can hear the teacher. You're about to get a taste of a deaf child's world. You'll see, hear and experience how background noise can affect a child during a lesson. Hearing aids and cochlear implants aim to provide hearing within the speech frequencies. The microphones pick up sounds from around the wearer. Unfortunately, they're not selective, so all sound, including background noise, is picked up. But taking very simple measures can reduce this problem significantly. Girls and girls, eyes to the front, pencils down, 
You should have finished that part by now. The next task that we're going to do is you're going to think of three different things. So although that was a school as opposed to a nursery, I hope it gives you an idea of the implications of noise and some of the things that you can help to remove those barriers and improve access. So these are my top tips for communication. Uh, firstly, it's really important to get the child's attention first before you start talking to them. Background noise as illustrated in that video, try to reduce background noise to a minimum. Speak clearly and get closer, avoid speaking from a distance. Don't shout, shouting will lead to distortion. And encouragement, listening with a hearing loss is really hard work and really tiring. So giving extra clues and repeating instructions to help a child access the spoken word is really important. Being face to face, so making sure that your face can be seen clearly and facial expressions and lip patterns provide really important additional information. And then finally, giving more time to respond. A child with a hearing loss will be working really hard to process what they've heard, particularly if they're listening in noise. So we've covered two of the challenges. We've talked about distance and getting closer. We've talked about noise. The third is echo. And that might not be something that you would typically think of. Echo is the persistence of sound. So in our homes, we often have very good listening environments. So we have carpets and curtains and cushions and so on. And all of that absorbs the sound. That's not typically true of nurseries and early year settings and schools. So with hard floors, high ceilings and lots of windows to let light in, you often find that there's a lot of echo and echo leads to distortion and it makes the sound not as clear as it needs to be to hear speech clearly. So I'm going to illustrate that by letting you listen to a nursery before and after acoustic improvement so you can hear the echo in the room. Okay, here is Barton Hill Academy in Torquay. Very nice new nursery. Got a hard floor. Obviously walls and ceilings are plasterboard. So when this is full of children and teaching staff, etc., playing with obviously activities and things like that, the reverberation issue is a massive problem. So today we're going to install 38 acoustic clouds on the ceiling and then hopefully when I go around and film again you can hear the difference with my voice and the reverberation issue that they currently have. Okay to demonstrate what the difference 36 acoustic absorber clouds make as I'm talking you can hear the difference with the reverberation issue that was previously here before we put the clouds up. So as I'm walking around, this is gonna be a much better comfortable space for the staff and students to be in and communicate in. And just to sort of make a comparison of a treated room compared to a non-treated room, as I walk into the toilets, which has not yet been treated, you can hear the difference that our acoustic clouds can actually make. So again, hard floors, hard walls and a ceiling, which is exactly what's the same as in the other room, the main room. But as I'm walking through, now that reverberation issue is completely disappeared. I do hope that your sound quality was good enough and you were actually able to perceive the difference of the echo and then the improvement with the echo. And that makes a real difference to deaf children. Deaf children find it incredibly hard and tiring listening in poor acoustic environments. Having said that, if it's not possible to have acoustic improvement like that in terms of the clouds, these are the top tips of things that you can do in a listening environment. So any sort of furnishings will help to absorb echo. So things like cushions and carpets, bean bags, displays on the walls and table coverings are all things that will help to improve the listening environment. 
I mentioned at the start that I'm an author of some deaf education mesh guides. So if you were to Google understanding hearing loss and put my name, Katie Mitchell, Mitchell, you will come up with this guide. And this goes through step by step, providing you with more information about the nature of hearing loss, degree of hearing loss, amplification and ways to help and lots more information. If you hit on the top home tab, you will then bring up the index, which has got another um, other mesh guides on glue ear um, and music to promote early language which also would be really useful for you to look at. Um, I'd really like to thank you for, for listening and just to encourage you that you can take really simple steps but that will make a huge difference to improve the speech outcomes um, and the speech access and speech outcomes for deaf children. Um, if you would like to ask me any questions and connect with me via email, that's my email address and I would love to hear from you. Katie, thank you so much. It was extremely interesting and the video clips were really good. It's um, very interesting to understand how life might sound for some people with, with hearing loss. And the top tips that you ran through um, are really useful. And what really struck me was that the concentration needed for a child in a classroom, um, that they must be so tired by the end of the day, just the, the concentration to listen uh, is really hard going. Uh, there was a question that came through. Um, is there any funding available for adjustments to be made? That's a really good question. So children on my caseload who have been identified um, as having a hearing loss and have the um, disability living allowance, then it's brilliant now that the DAF funding, disability access funding that comes in at three, is a pot of money um, that can be used to improve. Um, I've also heard of, um, of nurseries trying to use inclusion funding and special needs funding within their local authority to get acoustic improvement. Yes. And I've also known families and nurseries to champion crowdfunding so I had a family that little girl was going into a nursery that was literally a barn and a listed building but a beautiful beautiful nursery um, and actually she got in touch with a local newspaper set up crowdfunding and they raised four thousand pounds to put in 20 between 20 and 30 clouds which made a huge huge difference so I think where there's a will there's a way normally in terms of funding thank you that's brilliant. Thank you so much for attending today. I Pleasure. hope you're going to stay. I am. I am. Thank you so much. Thank Lovely. you. Lovely. Thank you. So we're going to move on to our next speaker. Um, this is Catherine McLeod. Um, she is the chief executive from Dingley's Promise. And um, their mission is to deliver life changing support to under fives with special educational needs and disabilities and their families. So thank you very much, Catherine, and I shall hand over to you. Lovely, thank you very much. Can you all see my screen to check? Yes. <clears throat> yes, lovely. Perfect. So I'm I'm going to let you all down now. I've got no videos at all in my presentation, so <laughs> apologise for that. Um, so yeah, my name is Catherine McLeod. I'm the Chief Executive of Dingley's Promise. Um, in the presentation today, I'm going to just talk to you about SEND in the early years, um, special educational needs and disabilities in the early years, um, go through um, who Dingley's Promise are and what we do, um, a little bit about the beliefs that underpin that work. And then I'm going to have a look at the national picture around children with SEND and what's happening at the moment in nurseries and, and settings where you will soon be. Um, and then having a look at training topics and the key uh, messages in each of those topics that are live at the moment um, and then just a little bit about how you can get involved. Um, I know that uh, for a lot of people um, special educa educational needs and disabilities is something that uh, they may have in their lives, they may have relatives, friends, um, people that they know and it's often an area where people are really passionate about it which is brilliant and if any of you listening are passionate about it we want to link up with you. We want to help you in any way to um, support children with SEND in, in the best way possible. So Dingley's Promise as an organisation, we're a national charity. Uh, we currently have five centres and in our centres, they're, they're um, specialist centres, so not um, mainstream inclusive centres. 
um, and we work directly with children and with their families, making sure that they have the right strategies at the right time. And <clears throat> we work with them um, from the day they join us. We support their families um, and we give them strategies to be able to really thrive in early years. Wherever possible, we transition them into the mainstream and we also support those mainstream settings to have those strategies and to continue that journey for, for each child in the best way for them. Um, we also have a national training programme that began in 2018, so it's fairly new, but actually um, it's grown extremely fast because until the new announcements about the earliest educator criteria recently, um, which have said that there is going to be a whole section on send and inclusion in the qualification going forward, but until that, actually there hasn't been much in the way of specific send and inclusion content in the early educator qualification. So we've been really working hard to try and plug that gap by supporting practitioners with training. So at the moment, we have a national programme. We have one programme that's funded by the Department for Education with the Council for Disabled Children. Um, but we have a big programme funded by Comic Relief um, where we're working with 30 local authorities. And in those areas, all of the training is free for anybody who's working in the, in the early years. So it's a really exciting opportunity for anyone who wants to um, access those. We're a partner in the Thames Valley Stronger Practice Hub, and all of you will, of course, be hearing more about Stronger Practice Hubs, which are there to support the earliest sector across the country, uh, which is funded by the DfE. Um, and we um, are also very much involved in raising the voice of children with SEND in the early years. I think in early years discussions, um, it can often be the topic that people, I had this recently and I won't say who from, but a big organisation said to me, oh, we will think about children with SEND, but first we're going to do the main early years stuff and later on we'll do a deep dive into SEND. And I think what we all have to realise is that SEND is not a separate thing that you can just worry about later on. It is core to practice and good set practice benefits all children. So it's about bringing it into the to the mainstream rather than making it an add on or something to look at later. Um, and then finally, we lead the National Early Years Send Specialist Providers Forum. So if you know of any specialist early years providers, please do pop me their details and my my details will be at the end of this of this slideshow so please do share because um we want to make sure they're supported there aren't that many of them in the country so around beliefs and beliefs about how how we work and how we think um the earlier should work for children we send um evidence shows that having some experience of inclusion in the mainstream is better than none for children's life outcomes and i think sometimes um, practitioners and sometimes family, families will think, well, actually, we think this child is going to need special education sometime down the road. We don't want to mess them around, so let's just send them straight to special education. And actually, the evidence is showing that it's better if they do have some time in the mainstream alongside their peers, and that actually helps them in, in the long term. So that's a really important concept that, that needs to be there. Um, secondly, the line between specialist and mainstream provision needs to be flexible so it's similar to the first the first point but I think it's also about um, once children go into for example a special nursery attached to a special school it's quite rare that they come out again the, in the work that we do when I started at the organization about 30 percent of the children who left us went to the mainstream and now it's settled at around 70 percent of the children who left us go to the mainstream and it's because we are much more flexible about sort of understanding that the journey could go in and out and it's about what's right for that child at that time and it's about us working really closely with families to say there is no preordained place or journey that your child will take and as as early as practitioners that's really important because often families will say well you know uh maybe a doctor has told us that our child wouldn't thrive in in a nursery and actually they might and they often can so it's just about always thinking of potential and not making judgments I have to have to mention one person so there's um he's the youngest black lecturer at Oxford University and it was really interesting he's got his job recently 
and until he was 11 he couldn't speak and actually his parents were told in early years he would never ever even be able to live without support he'd never be able to have an independent life because that's the journey he was going to be taking and I think for me I, I got goose pimples when I heard that because as in the early years we have such a responsibility because if we say oh yeah yeah this child will never be able to do that and you know and we push them into special education actually you know we don't know what the future is going to bring so I just think it's that really important point about we don't know and we have to be really open to what children are going to be able to do um so mainstream settings can support many children effectively losing using inclusive practice things um a message that comes out fairly regularly is well we we can support children if we have one-to-ones for them i think what a lot of people talk about is a velcro vera is the sort of slang that's used around that adult who is stuck to a child to to support them and make sure they're okay. again adults for children are not helped by having too much interaction with one adult who's with them in in a um, an early years setting and I think we all have to challenge ourselves to work inclusively effectively so that we're not over relying on those one-to-ones and we are giving the child the full experience in the early years alongside their peers um, and then finally I think just to find that parents really are the experts on their children but that honest discussion and challenge is vital and so I'll talk a little bit more about this in a minute but it is I think earlier settings have really good relationships with parents and obviously we're supporting their their most precious little bundle when and they trust us with that child but there are a number of situations where practitioners will say well I don't I don't really want to have that honest discussion because it might upset the family and I don't feel confident to have it and therefore I won't but actually parents feed back to us we want the settings to challenge us we want the settings constructively obviously but we want the settings to really have open conversations about what is best for our child so that's a really important thing to be doing nationally um we have a quite difficult situation at the moment with numbers of children with send rising significantly so the early as alliance research found 73 percent of settings saying the number of children with send is going up in their settings um but at the same time the capacity to support children seems to be decreasing so 28% of settings reported they turned children with send away and 92% had to use their own funds to support them. Um, it's becoming more common for, for settings to say we can't take children with send at the moment. Yes, there's a recruitment and, a, and retention crisis at the moment, but at the same time, we have to put that emphasis, as I said before, on really high quality inclusive practice as opposed to one to one support and needing extra staff on the ground it's not easy at all but these are the patterns at the moment so Coram uh, did some research recently and only 18 percent of local authorities believe they have enough provision for children with send in the early years and i'm going to pause because that's terrifying only 18 percent of our areas have enough provision for those children and certainly for us that's a major sort of driving factor so when we hear those numbers, we know we have to make a difference. We have to make it better. New in, whenever new entitlements come in. So traditionally, when the two year old funding came in and, um, and the three and four year old funding, that's uh, the 15 hours and then the 30 hours, it reduced provision for children with SEND because settings are struggling to meet the new demands. And actually, it was the children with SEND who lost their provision as a result of, of those um, new free entitlements. So this new entitlement's just been announced again. We're very worried about what that's going to mean for children with SEND. And then finally, just to flag, three and four parents have to give up work because of a lack of support for their children. And that's from the Disabled Children's Partnership. So I don't want to press everyone. It will get more positive after this. But just to say that we recognise at the moment it's a really, really difficult situation for settings and for practitioners. And what we want to do is try to support as much as possible good practice and opening up some of those places for children with SEND again. So the issue focused training um, that we have at the moment, um, so we we focus very much on an introduction to early years inclusive practice um, and that is um, very much focused on looking at um, 
the um, child-centered practice, then looking at communication and the ways that children communicate, and then looking at wider systems and ways to um, use other professionals, link in and really support children and families um, as, as standard. So that's really critical. And what I really want to underline is it's not about SENCOs only. It's, you're going to tell me to stop, aren't you? Sorry, it's, I'm going to be really quick. So Karina's just turned up and I can see her face. Um, that's, it's not just about SENCOs. What it's about is all of you individuals really having a knowledge of basic inclusive practice. Second one is around transitions. Big, big note for this one is the biggest learning from learners was actually that it is about really supporting families. Everyone thought they supported families really well and, and, and informed them about what transition means. But actually, they felt that once they did the training, they realised there was much more they could do for families. The third one, difficult conversations. Again, it's very difficult sometimes to have a, what it was a hard conversation with a family about how their child is doing. So that's giving guidance around that. Behaviours that challenge the issue around behaviours is behaviours are not something that children are doing to be bad or to challenge you. They are actually trying to communicate something. Training is about changing that mindset. We've got a lot more in development. Um, I'll very quickly go past that. I won't tell you what the trainees are saying. But what I will say to you is that all the trainees, when they finish the training, 96% say they can support more children. And I just want you to think about, you know, it is about knowledge, but it's also about confidence. And when knowledge and confidence comes together for children with SEND in, in their practitioners, it does open more places for children with SEND. And that helps to address that real issue of not enough places um, in the system at the moment. Um, so how can you get involved? Join our national movement of inclusion champions, take our training, follow our socials, join our inclusion champions Facebook page. I just I want to say to anyone who is now in the process of qualifying, you have a power in this situation. You have a power to make this better. We absolutely need more inclusion and we need you as champions to include children with SEND. Um, so, yeah, I apologise. I've taken about two minutes too long, but thank you ever so much for listening. Thank you so much, Catherine. Yes, sorry to uh, to appear and frighten you. <laughs> um, it, it was very interesting. And um, I think one of the things that uh, was resonated with me certainly is that the line between mainstream and specialists needs to be far more flexible. And that, um, you know, we shouldn't limit children uh, and that the full experience uh, should be the same for those with SEND as those without so uh, it was very interesting so thank you very very much for that right i'm going to move along to our next speakers and uh, we have amanda richardson and pilar cloud and they are from action cerebral palsy and their mission is that every child and young person in the uk with cerebral palsy is able to access from birth onwards the best possible intervention care education and support which means their complex and changing needs are met so thank you very much i shall hand over great I'm going to just share my screen and then we'll get going. Uh, just a second and make certain everybody can see. Um, hopefully. There we go. OK. Over to Amanda, I think. Um, hi. Hello, everybody. Um, and uh, Pilar and I are just so, uh, so pleased to be here again because we're just uh, very briefly reiterate uh, what Katie and Catherine have said previously, you in the early years create the foundation of learning for our, our children and young people as they go through life. You are truly the first step of that ladder and the base of that scaffold. Um, and I think it is so important to remember that those third, first three years of life is when that the babies and the child's brain is just just making those connections so much, which is why this focus on special educational needs and uh, disabilities is so critical, because as we all know, uh, often it takes some time for children with special educational needs and disabilities to be assessed, 
to have their needs fully understood. And so it falls on you guys, I'm afraid, to make a difference for those children um, before the point of often before the point of diagnosis and it particularly afterwards. So I'm not going to repeat what we do, but we are um, Pilla and I both have far too many years experience of working with children with cerebral palsy. I myself was a teacher, uh, then a head teacher um, in a school for children with uh, complex disability um, and then went on to um, lead Action Cerebral Palsy as a national campaigning organisation. So thanks for the next slide. Yeah, I'll go on to that. We've got a very, very short amount of time. And so um, I'm just going to literally summarise this. But we have tried to cram in as many links for you for further um, information if you should require it. Uh, so just as a very brief summary, what is cerebral palsy? Uh, fundamentally, it's a, um, a neurological condition which has its origins in um, the baby's first two years of life starting at conception. Um, so it is interference in the way that the, the baby's, um, the developing baby's central nervous system develops and can also be a result of extreme prematurity, maternal infection during pregnancy, and sadly sometimes injury or, or um, brain um, issues with the brain or infections with the brain after birth. We know that there are um, approximately 30,000 children living in the UK with cerebral palsy, and it is a lifelong condition. However, with really good intervention and early intervention, we know that a lot of the effects of cerebral palsy can be mitigated. Um, and the earlier that children acquire the skills that they need to learn, um, particularly in those vital three years, um, first three years, the better the prospects are for them as they go on through their educational years. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> so we know um, that there are often misconceptions about what cerebral palsy is, and cerebral palsy is often seen purely as a physical condition. It isn't. It is a neurological condition and the spectrum of need for children who have cerebral palsy is huge. You may have a child who is very mildly affected with cerebral palsy, who is able to access all aspects of learning and whose cognitive development is absolutely unimpaired right across that spectrum to children who are profoundly um, affected by cerebral palsy. It is not a neural, it is not purely a physical condition. It is a condition that primarily affects tone and the child's ability to move in a functional way. Um, we're going to come on into in a minute um, to talk about those early warning signs. But the reason we want to really um, underline the importance of this early identification for which you in the early years are often very, very key is because of this very complex effect on ongoing health learning and well-being um, that cerebral palsy can have. So the underlying issue for children with cerebral palsy is an abnormality of tone. And I'm sure many of you will have um, heard of the expression spasticity or low tone or floppy a floppy child, child with floppy movements. Um, spasticity is very high tone. So it's tone which means that the a child's joints are often stiff or they find it difficult to fully um, uh, make full movements of their joints. And because of that uh, tone, that can make accessing uh, active learning quite hard. They, it may result in issues with not just with walking, but with balance, um, with um, coordination, with fine motor skills, the use of their hands um, and their fingers the bilaterality, the way that they use two hands together, which is so critical, particularly in the early years when those 
babies are working in midline and they really need to understand where their midline is, their sense of, um, uh, of their own bodies, um, but also when they start to manipulate, um, fine manipulation of objects and toys, and also for um, stability. So all children will naturally use one hand um, as, as a lead hand, if you like, or one arm as a lead hand and use the other for stability. If there's that abnormality of tone, particularly if it's arising in the trunk, then that ability to use their, their upper limbs to stabilise um, and to access learning can be compromised. Now, the other side of the um, tone and postural issues is the sensory issues. Because cerebral palsy is a, is a neurological condition, there will often be an abnormality of sensory processing. I was really interested in what Katie was saying earlier um, about the way that babies receive information auditory information. It's often the case that children with cere cerebral palsy will have an abnormal um, or altered state of um, awareness, of, of arousal and of awareness and the, and the ability to process sensory information coming into their systems. So a lot of the things that um, Katie was talking about earlier, we really need to bear in mind for children who may be at risk of cerebral palsy um, and often if they haven't, if you are not aware as a practitioner that that child has a diagnosis of cerebral palsy, but have noticed that they may have issues with movement, um, uh, which we'll come on to in a minute, um, some of those children may respond because of that onslaught of sensory information with a sort of shutdown response, um, which which sort of confuses the issue a little bit as well. So. As with ch children with auditory processing issues or, or hearing issues, um, often sensory information in the early years uh, room or ongoing into the classroom can be quite challenging for, for children with cerebral palsy. That's, again, something to be aware of. Um, the other issue will be around um, the associated health needs of children with cerebral palsy. There may be problems with swallow. There may be problems because of problems with, with swallow, because it is a, an issue to do with mus the muscular system. Um, there may be issues to do with nutrition. Um, also, there may be associated issues around health, um, respiratory issues, or um, uh, issues to do with um, general well-being, skin conditions, etc. Children with cerebral palsy will also find life, everyday life, extremely tiring for all of the reasons that we we've heard before in um, Katie's presentation, but also because of that constant being on constant alert, because their system is working so hard to process and understand what's going on, but also if their mobility is compromised, they will often have a sense of anxiety about their own physical safety. So again, they that can um, often affect um, their ability to focus and concentrate because they're a little bit in that fight or flight mode as well. So for all of those reasons, we as practitioners need to be super focused on how the children in our care are developing. Um, it is so much to ask you. And I, you know, I, I, I just so much agree with what Catherine was saying earlier. You know, knowledge is power. Um, and, and as early as practitioners, you, you are absolutely absolutely in that front line of being there uh, to, to support your children, but also perhaps to be that conduit between them and their families and their, their parents um, and to raise those, those uh, concerns if you have them. So I'm going to move um, on to Pilar now, who's going to talk about um, early motor development and the warning signs that uh, perhaps um, a child is experiencing uh, challenges with their motor movement, motor development. Thank, Thank you, you. Thank you, Amanda. And, and it sounds like actually the, the, the first stat is similar to what Katie cited, which is uh, basically 50% of um, babies or children who go on to be diagnosed with cerebral palsy are not known or believed to be at risk from birth. 
Unfortunately, though, it's these children who are not perceived to be at risk that go undetected because very often parents and also the general public um, aren't aware of what those signs of uh, those sort of red flags are. Um, and so we have launched a campaign very recently called If in Doubt, Check It Out, uh, which is encouraging parents um, to uh, understand uh, more about typical development and also what those flags are and what they should do if they spot them. And you all are so ideally placed as a safety net. Um, we've heard too often that children aren't getting picked up until they're of school age. And so they've missed out on those sort of crucial first two or three years of life where you really can have a significant impact um, for their lifelong prospects. So I'm just going to touch on the, the warning signs um, for you and then uh point you to our website where we have a poster and parent information leaflet all on this topic. And I think probably the, the first warning sign um, is just that children, the child is not meeting those typical um, motor developmental milestones. They're not sitting by uh, eight months. They're not walking by 18 months. Um, Beyond that, though, if you notice a child feels very floppy or is very stiff or is a combination of the two, that is clearly a sign. If a child has very jerky movements or difficulty controlling their own movement, um, that's a concerning sign. If they're not able to kick their legs or move their arms and legs while they're lying, or as Amanda mentioned, finding midline, if they're not able to find that midline or reach to their feet. Um, if they are using one side of their body significantly less than the other, that's something to be concerned about. And in terms of sort of the sensory side, if they're very distressed or not reacting to uh, movement, touch, sound, or smell, if they're not making eye contact or following movements with their head and eyes. Beyond that, if they're having difficulty sucking, feeding, or swallowing, those are all the sort of red flags that it may be nothing. We're not trying to diagnose at this point, but it is those are signs of concern that really, um, if you spot them um, in a child, please encourage parents to see their GP or their health visitor. All that needs to happen next is a referral for an assessment. So I'll stop there and let Amanda carry on, but we're so grateful for this time um, to be able to share this information with you. You're, you're so highly pleased to help these. So thank you. Thank you. Well, <clears throat> um, I think just one thing to add to that is, again is just to reiterate the fact that 50% of children that go on to uh, receive a diagnosis are not identified at birth and mm -hmm. it falls on the families and uh, frontline professionals to uh, raise that uh, raise that concern and quite often we do know that there is a sort of wait and see attitude um you know amongst people it, it's it's like well come back in six months and let's see what's happening in six months well as you know six months in a child's life is a very long time in terms of lost learning or, or loss uh, loss of or reduced access to learning so it's a huge responsibility that you have um, and don't please don't hesitate if you have a concern it's not your job it's not our job to diagnose but please make sure that that family and that those uh, support in having those difficult conversations is so important but those conversations must happen um so moving on um thinking about um what we were sort of preparing this i think there was a sort of query about how if you're particularly interested in supporting children who have motor difficulties what sort of areas can you um can you go into um so first of all a brilliant resource for anyone who may have um a child with any form of motor um, difficulty is the PD network, um, PDNet. Um, they have lots of resources there and um, they do offer 
um, courses, I think, up to level three as well in physical disability. So that's the first place to look. Um, if you want to go further and become more specialist in uh, your training, um, uh, you know, there are routes to becoming specialist teachers for for um, children with physical disability. And again, I should mention that, that if you have that as a local service, do use that resource even before the child has any HCP or has, has any s form of um, uh, diagnosis. You know, you can always approach your local team for, for advice and support there. Um, so we know that um, you, you can uh, um, train or do extra courses in, in physical disability and the best place to look for that um, information is at the P on the PD network site. Um, they, they may also have, I'm not sure, but they may have be able to direct you to regional um, colleges or universities that may offer um, advanced courses for um, educational professionals. Um, and then of course there is a specific uh, profession called conductive edu or conductors, people trained in conductive education, um, which is not just for children, but goes right through from, from babies right through to adulthood. And they're trained in supporting people with cerebral palsy or motor conditions um, to um, be as independent as possible. And uh, sometimes conductors are available to come into schools to support uh, um, children with cerebral palsy alongside the therapeutic team of OT, physios, speech and language therapists, etc., and can be a very valuable um, resource. So um, where are we going next? Well, <clears throat> we are very aware that cerebral palsy is a bit of a poor relation sometimes or seems to be a bit of a poor relation in the disability world. And so uh, we want to, following on from uh, quite a bit of um, uh, policy work that we've done recently through um, an all party parliamentary group, to look at how we can develop um, a toolkit on cerebral palsy. Um, and we want to do that very much through through um, co-production with our colleagues throughout the, um, the health and education sectors. Uh, and that's something that we've made a start with, but we are very interested in um, developing further. So if any of you are interested in supporting uh, the development of a uh, cerebral palsy toolkit, um, which is there to support families, specifically families and first line professionals such as yourselves, um, we would be very interested in hearing from you. So um, thank you very much for listening. We are so grateful for this opportunity. Um, and we really do value your, um, your you know, your, your interest in our work. Thank you. Thank you so much. <clears throat> um, it's been really interesting listening to you. And a couple of things that uh, really have, have come to me is that it's about awareness, awareness, awareness. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, with that awareness, it's understanding the red flags. So yeah. really grateful for your time today. Um, and I'm going to move on swiftly because unfortunately we are running about 15 minutes late. I knew this would happen. <laughs> so I would like to introduce to you uh, Gillian Dixon. Um, she's from the Adult Learning Services at North Tyneside Council. And um, Gillian has with her uh, two of her previous learners and um, they, they provide uh, standalone courses and apprenticeships across a wide range of subject areas. Gillian, thank you. Hello there, everybody. Can everybody hear me OK? Yeah, yeah. brilliant. Thank you. Can I just say, first off, um, thank you to Karina and Stacey for inviting us to take part in this presentation. Um, it's a real honour and a privilege to be here. And secondly, um, what amazing speakers today. It's just absolutely fantastic. I could go on and on about that, but I'm aware of time. So thank you. It's just been so interesting. Um, my name is Gillian Dixon. I'm the Early Years Tutor Assessor with the Adult Learning Service, part of Employment and Skills at North Tyneside Council. And um, Kim's my colleague. This is Kim Nash, who's the other Early Years Tutor Assessor. And we deliver level two, level three, early years practitioner diplomas, as well as SENCO training. And we um, we also work with a number of fantastic early years settings in North Tyneside Council. 
Um, and one in particular is Fieldhouse Nursery, um, who have been part of kindly um, part of this presentation. And um, today we've brought along Sarah, who was the deputy manager and who also did our Senko training with us and is very passionate about um, working with children with special educational needs and disabilities. And we also brought along Lauren, who is a level three apprentice. And we've got some good news about Lauren today that we'd like to share <laughs> as well. Um, obviously, everything that Kim and I, um, as part of the training with regards to skills and knowledge, you know, um, embedded throughout is about early intervention and inclusion. And then obviously it's our learners who then um, go off into their settings and implement all of this fantastic practice. And um, we're going to be swapping chairs around because um, Lauren and Sarah are actually the stars of our presentation. And they are going to talk about um, two children in particular who they work with, Roman and Rosie. Um, and we've got some wonderful photographs of Roman and Rosie to share with you and some wonderful stories to celebrate their lives. Um, you know, and it, it's building on what we've already seen in the presentations prior to that. I'd just like to stress that um, we, we do have permission from Roman and Rosie's parents that we can use their photographs, we can use their, their name and we can talk about their lives to celebrate that. So everybody that's included in, um, in our presentation, we do have permission to share that information. Um, Kim's also, you know, got an early years tutor and she works closely with Lauren. Yeah. Um, I'm just going to share the screen so that you can see sort of the PowerPoint as um, Sarah and Lauren are going to run through um, a little bit of information about it all. So I'll We'll try to, to uh, not go over time. Obviously, that's us on the front there. You can see Kim and I at the top and Sarah and Lauren at the bottom. Can I just check it? Can everybody see that screen OK? Yes, it's lovely. Thank you. Yeah, it's great. Thank you. So within our presentation, we're hoping to cover our children and families within Fieldhouse Nursery, how we support them, the professionals we work with, the resources and inclusion, the training and raising awareness, qualifications and professional practice, and the impact that we have on children and families as well. So um, here at Fieldhouse Nursery, we value and support all babies and children in an inclusive way to support their individual needs prior to their attendance. <laughs> Firstly, we gain written information from parents and carers and our youngest babies are invited to join our baby social club. So within all of our written documentation as children are starting with us, there is a section in there to complete um, for the parents if they're, they're concerned about any um, if they've got any concerns about send with with their children and then when we invite them to their our baby social club it's all about building up those um strong relationships with the staff members at nursery just to give them that confidence to be able to kind of divulge any of that information they feel we need to know um, we have developed our own unique curriculum which supports our children's learning and development and we follow North Tyneside's graduated approach to ensure that we implement the correct and appropriate early interventions and smart targets if we feel our children require any individualised interventions. Um, these can be used to provide evidence for parents and carers and other professionals to demonstrate our targeted learning and to provide informative information and additional funding streams and other professionals and to build a picture of each individual child. Our parents are our partners and we keep them fully involved um, and informed of everything via parent consultations throughout the year. We do also provide um, early help assessment meetings. We have TAF meetings as well, which involve the professionals that that come along to our meetings just to make sure that our parents are fully informed with everything that is going on at nursery. So um, to support our children and families, um, it's, it's a highly important factor at nursery. If we feel that um, our children require any support or we have kind of recognised anything early on, so say if some of our um, older babies haven't got um, as much language as we, was, we would expect for that age, 
um, we would implement something called an individual play plan. Um, and we would start off with something such as a language bag so we can see exactly where the children would be in their development. We would then go on to um, complete a piece of paperwork, which is called the building and emerging picture of the child. So we'd look at the three primary areas of their learning and we would look at the strengths and concerns within those three areas. So we could then take this um, to a meeting with our parents and we can discuss the kind of what our concerns are with within those three primary areas of their development. Um, when we get together, we can complete other bits of paperwork, such as a one page profile. So this is written by us, but kind of from our child's point of view. And we talk about what what people would appreciate about the child, what's important to the child, how they like to be supported and um, within our um, nursery. Um, we also complete things such as ABC charts. So if we have children who may display some challenging behaviours or they are dysregulated quite often and there's triggers to, to why that is happening, we can note those down and we can work out what those triggers are and see if we can support that in any way as well. And then we would look at kind of further down the line if we need to involve any other um, professionals, if we need to apply for any early years inclusion funding or if we need to look at um, kind of educational health and care needs assessments as well. Here are some pictures of Rosie who is living with Down syndrome and has a hearing impairment with an almond nursery. As a key person, it was my responsibility to make sure Rosie's needs were adapted and were met within our nursery. So it was important for me to supply Rosie with as many learning opportunities as possible. Uh, when thinking of the activities, I worked with Sarah and um, the porch team the physiotherapist and the SALT team to come up with an individual play plan, which I would use with Rosie every day to support our needs. For example, we use activities to support our fine motor skills and our gross motor skills and just a hand-eye coordination as well. For example, on the first picture, you can see I using a hand-eye coordination and a pincer grasp to pull. It was just doing these activities to gain our strength in our muscles and in our hands as well. And this is where Rosie is at now in the older room in the daisies. Rosie is now able to stand with a weighted hoop and she's able to use a hand eye coordination effectively to place the hoop onto the pole. Rosie is also now crawling and doing support steps as well. The outcome of this working with Rosie has allowed her to access more of the curriculum independently as well. Um, so when we look at partnership working, we look at all of the professionals that we are involved with. And um, so we have worked with lots and lots of professionals. Um, we work a lot with speech and language with a lot of our children. We have found that communication and language um, and the use of speech has um, has increased over the past couple of years. So we've we've had a lot of intervention from speech and language. We work with um, the Portage team, the educational psychologists. We work a lot with Judith Rose, who is our local area SENCO. Um, and we have SEN surgeries with her every month um, it's where we can discuss um, some any of our children or some concerns we might have about our children. And she can give us guidance as to where we might need to kind of go with those children. Um, we have worked alongside paediatricians, physiotherapists, the sensory team as well with Rosie in regards to her hearing impairment and they've provided some training for us as well. And we do work alongside all of our health visitors. Um, one person that isn't on here but I would like to talk about is the schools. Um, we work alongside our schools, especially with our preschool children who are heading off to school. We try and we send out letters to parents to gain information from them as to what school the children will be going to. I have made contact with all of those schools and we have meetings set up with the school senkos, the nursery teachers, the reception teachers and some of the head teachers are coming along to, to TAFs and early help assessments as well. Um, and one of the, a couple of the schools have invited us in so we can go and have a look around the setting and take some photos that we can take back into nursery with us just to give all of the children, but especially the children with with SEND, um, the best transition that, that they can get. I would just like to say about as being an apprentice as well, that it was really useful when working with Rosie to be in the TAF meetings and working with Portage, the physiotherapist and the sensory team, because as so much I was learning on the course, I was also able to learn from them to gain my own knowledge on SEND as well. 
and we do have some resources and inclusion that we do without the nursery as well. So on the 21st of March, we celebrate Rock Your Socks, where all the team and the children will come in with odd socks to support World Down Syndrome Day. And we have resources such as books, the Ability in May books, which are Down Syndrome, ADHD, speech delays and autism. We also have small little dolls that we have in the rooms, which support children with Down Syndrome as well and hearing impairments. And then we support deaf awareness by using visual cards, Macintosh and baby sign throughout the whole nursery as well. Anything that we do, um, anything we do kind of celebrates the Neurodiversity Celebration Week or Autism Acceptance Week. Everything is posted on our nursery Facebook page as well, so parents are aware of everything that is going on. We do share lots of information through Facebook in regards to the parent carer forums, the local offer and anything going on within North Tyneside um, so our parents can access anything that they need. Um, so just these photos here. So this is um, this is Roman on our pictures and this what he is using in these photographs is um, muffic boards. So Roman has a condition called tuberous sclerosis, which mum has allowed me to to share with you today. And what that means is um, it, he has little tumours growing on different organs in his body and it can cause it can cause um, developmental delay. So Roman is already meant to be in reception, but he has deferred his place and will be going there this year. Um, and it has affected his balance and coordination. So the Muffic boards have really supported his, his balance, his coordination and using his physical skills. And then we also have a balance board as well. And that's really supported him with using his, um, his balance and his key person. You can see in the photograph there is helping. Um, him to, to balance but he is now using that independently as well and he can balance on that really well and that was all purchased through the use of his um early years inclusion funding that, Rosie. <laughs> yeah <laughs> so yeah as you can see rosie would just celebrate in world dancing drum day by doing the socks and she was given odd socks which she could paint with her friends as well and if you can see just behind the photo with rosie there's a little chair which we got so we were able to adapt activities so Rosie could have more group play to encourage more socialisation as well. Um, so as a setting, we have um, accessed lots and lots of different training. Um, in this photograph, this is one of my um, staff members, Joanne. She's in our preschool room. She's completed the portage training, but we've done a lot of training around deaf awareness, behaviour management, sensory processing, transitions to school. And um, we did, myself and um, Lindsay, my nation manager, attended the autism conference as well. And then I did obviously complete my um, my level three um, SENCO award as well through N NCFA CASH. So um, just moving on to the next slide, as Sarah's just shared with everybody, she did the SENCO course with us. Sarah was an outstanding learner. Um, and we, you know, here at the Adult Learning Service, we feel that, you know, continuous professional development is really, really important. So although Sarah had such a busy day at nursery, she did come along to the night classes. And um, as you can see, there's a wonderful picture there of Sarah um, being presented with our SENCO qualification by Judith Rose, who's our area um, Senko at North Tyneside and you know just well done on all your hard work and your dedication Sarah and you're just an outstanding practitioner. And um, we also have a photograph of Lauren so we've referred to Lauren throughout this presentation as an apprentice but um, she's recently completed a final endpoint assessment and received an overall distinction grade and again that was through NCFV and CASH so you know, it just shows um, a dedication and hard work throughout our apprenticeship and, you know, a dedication to work in an early year. So, again, we're really proud. Of and a dedication to support him. So yeah, 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 it was amazing. Amazing. yeah. And um, so we're really proud of both Sarah and Lauren for, you know, all of their achievements with us and their continued hard work. So obviously we've talked a lot about partnership working and the importance of working with other professionals and working with families and parents and carers. But whilst we were putting this presentation together, we really started to think about what impact are we having on children and families 
and um, you know, Sarah and Lauren just want to share with you some comments that they've received from parents and carers. It was a real privilege to be looking after Rosie as an apprentice as well, and it was really nice to hear from the parents when she moved to a different room, the support that I've given them, but also the benefits and opportunities that I give to Rosie as well. Here's a few of the comments that Rosie's mum wrote on the card that it was nice to see that I comfort her when she needed and being so mindful and conscientious of her needs and the time, effort and patience I put in with her physio as it was a daily thing. Um, we also recently just had our offset inspection and Rosie's mum was very, very kind and wrote a letter to Ofsted. She couldn't be that um, there that day, um, but she wanted Ofsted to be aware of what we've done for Rosie within the setting. So I've just picked out some kind of key points, which I think are really important to show the impact that we've had on them as a family. Um, so I'll just go through a few of the things that I think um, have, have been important. So um, Rosie is two. Um, she has Down syndrome. She is the first child in the history of nursery and my manager's career. So Lindsay's been manager for over 20 years and she, Rosie is the first child in the history of nursery to attend. Um, Rosie started Fieldhouse at 11 months and she's never followed the typical developmental miles, milestones, but at Fieldhouse it's never mattered. Throughout her time here she's thrived, but she's thrived because of the dedication of her key workers and the SALT team. Everyone at the nursery has made it their business to learn about D Down syndrome and to learn what it is and how it affects development. They've adapted rooms, activities and toys, etc. to suit Rosie, Rosie and guide her through milestones. All of this has been done out of their dedication to Rosie, not just the SEND guidelines. But most importantly for a parent, they have kept this entire experience inclusive. Rosie has stayed with her peers from the start and she has started to make friends. So I think that just shows for us and kind of from, from our perspective, how much of an impact we've had on them as a family, making them feel inclusive and seeing what they what they have seen of Rosie and of, our, of ourselves and our SEN practice. Can I just ask, did mm -hmm. the Ofsted inspector read that? The Ofsted inspector did read it, yes. <laughs> um, and we just want to finish off by saying, you know, thank you for listening to us and celebrating the lives of the children and families we're, we're privileged to support. Um, we hope you've enjoyed our presentation. And the final picture is just the entrance to Fieldhouse Nursery in Benton and North Townside. And you can see the wonderful garland and how welcome, you know, visitors, professionals, children and families are made at Fieldhouse Nursery. And um, so thank you for listening to us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I've just written down that it was inspirational to hear from Sarah and Lauren. Um, and I, I just think it's a wonderful setting uh, and you must be very proud. You really must. Um, I'd also like to take the opportunity to ask you to thank the parents for allowing the photos and sharing the conditions of the children, uh, because it, it, I think it certainly made a difference to your presentation, being able to see um, Roman and Rosie. It was really, really nice. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. OK, I'm going to move swiftly along um, and I'm going to invite Paul and Lorna to um, to join us and do their presentation if they are there. Lovely. So um, Paul and Lorna are from Nottingham Trent University and they are um, promoting SEND through their new SEND BA Honours degree, which starts in September 23. So I shall hand over to you now. Thank you very much. Thank you. And thank you very much for inviting us here today. Um, we really do appreciate this opportunity to inform you of our new course that is starting in September 2023. Um, I've got a couple of slides, so I'm just going to share our screen. So please bear with us for one second where I, I try and share our um, slides with you. It should work smoothly, but you know what these things can be like. Bear with me one second before we introduce ourselves. So my name is Lauren Wardle and I'm one of the principal lecturers here at the Institute of Education. And I've been working here for 10 years now. And while I've been working here, I started off as an early years practitioner and I came here with a wealth of knowledge in the early years background, but have continued to develop my academic um progression in my field of academia can you see the powerpoint yet 
can just yes. somebody just yes. we can yes, yeah yeah that. you can brilliant because i'm going like we can't see on this bit that we're sharing at the moment so you have got the powerpoint that's just fantastic which is why i was sort of sharing and not um, con a bit concerned you couldn't see so do apologize for that so i started off in the career of early years so i just want to like, reassure you i'm not here just to talk about one academic course but um i've developed and shaped my profession and continue to work in early years and education in its broader sense as well and I'll pass you over to Paul to introduce while I set the side show up. Oh, just to say hello. Um, thank you so much for giving us this time. I want to say thank you lot, all those people out there for giving up your time. I think we've learned anything from the presentations that have happened before is what a difference that you can make, whether you're young or not so young, because here at, um, in at Nottingham Trent University, you know, as long as you're over 18, doesn't matter how much more over 18 you are, you can join one of our courses. We're going to tell you a little bit about the course that specifically focus on special education, these disability and inclusion. Nona's going to start and then I'm going to pick up the baton. Okay. Thank you. So we've been introducing um, a new course to you that's starting in September 2023, but we have been delivering undergraduate provision um, relating to special educational needs since 2006. And this has been a part of our joint honours programme that we've been doing previously. However, due to the demands and need across a diverse range of sectors, we've um, decided to introduce a undergraduate special educational needs, disability and inclusion course. And we're really, really excited about offering this opportunity because it's for those that are generally interested in working with learners across all age ranges with special educational needs, disability and real focus on inclusion. We're looking at it from a national and international perspective and we're hoping it will examine um, a range of theoretical discourses, but also give students like yourselves practical strategies to help you with those future careers that you go and get jobs in in the future and look at different intervention strategies that will enable you to support those children and families and young people that you'll be hopefully working with in the future. The course itself will will not only be taught by us as academics but we'll be using people from um, a diverse range of the professionals within the field. So those that are working in schools, but also those professional organisations that you've got represented here today. So I shall move more on to the actual course itself. And here at Nottingham Trent University, we are hosting the course within School of Social Sciences, which is part of the Institute of Education. And we have uh, undergraduate, postgraduate courses and professional courses here in education in its broadest sense, focusing on early years, education, and obviously special educational needs, disability inclusion. We deliver these courses with ourselves that have come from either industry experience or those that are with an academic research experience. And we are providing courses that will enable you to go into direct graduate employment or on to further study. Um, and obviously some students will come here and decide they want to go and be a teacher and that they're convinced what they wanted to go in to do. But what we hope from this is that we give you the opportunity to have a chance of developing and understanding what your career trajectory might want to go into later. The course is delivered in Nottingham at our Clifton campus, and you can see some pictures there to demonstrate what the campus does actually look like. And it is a very nice, cosy campus on a bright day. You've got the lovely fields there, the lovely blossom, and it actually does look like that outside our window here. But it isn't delivered just in those lecture theatres, classrooms that you can see there. It's delivered outside in those fields. It's delivered in sports arena when we do some physical activities. It's also delivered in the community as well. Placement is embedded throughout and we invite professionals in. We're very keen to ensure that this course enables you to meet with professionals working in the sector, not only to give you that first hand experience of what it's like to go and do those jobs that you're training to do in the future, but open your eyes to other careers that are out there now and will be also available to you as government policy changes in the future and we'll be tuning into um, national and international agendas so therefore there's also opportunity to have online learning experiences internationally while you can network like you're doing today 
and there's opportunity to travel as well and go further afield to explore those opportunities. But I shall pass you to Paul to talk yeah. about how that looks like from a course perspective. Right. Hello, my name's Paul. I've been here since 2008 and before that I used to teach in special schools and residential homes and work in Effing colleges. But enough about me because this is about you. So I'm here to tell you what you can study or you will study and how you're going to study it and where it can lead. So first, what will you study if you come on this course? Well, on the screen now, we've got some of the, the modules that you will be able to uh, to engage with uh, if you come on this course. Let's say a few words about some of them. Inclusive learning the outdoors. We will be getting out into the woods here, the beautiful woods here in Clifton, and consider all the ways that children can learn through play and self-directed play, but also consider issues about accessibility and inclusion for children with a diverse range of needs outside the classroom. We'll also have sessions introducing some of those common special educational needs, autism, Down syndrome, cerebral palsy. In the second year, we will look at things around inclusive communication. That's everything from learning makatons, signs and symbols and how they can help learners with various communication needs to the use of technology as well. And meaningful movement will be considering how to meet some of the physical needs of learners with, with more complex and profound and multiple learning difficulties. Yes, you will be on a trampoline. Yes, you will be in a swimming pool. And actually, I'm very interested to listen to Jason, the speaker coming next. I would love it if we could get you surfing as well. Maybe we can talk later, Jason. In the third year, we look perhaps a bit broader picture. There's modules, as you, as you can see there, around leadership and working with other agencies. We're definitely encouraging students to look what's going to happen next. And we look at um, learners with a variety of needs, everything from English as an additional language to the needs of those learners that have been in care and those that from a refugee and asylum seeker background. Beyond those are the modules we'll do in the, the classroom and we also encourage you to do things outside as you can see there there's extra modules around everything from first aid to Makaton that you'll be able to take to enhance your employability skills. Well I will like to stress that the enhancement opportunities these do not come with any additional costs we've included <laughs> the into well, our your own hand course. In your pocket. Yes, right. so, um, we acknowledge that you know coming on to <laughs> an undergraduate degree does come with um, a cost but we've actually incorporated additional qualifications into the course. So you leave here with a undergraduate qualification um, with your degree, as well as these additional yeah. um, qualifications. We as want well. you to gain valuable skills, but you don't have to pay any more for them. I like That's what great. you did yeah, there. That's absolutely. brilliant. OK, so how do you study? Well, um, I think the, the main thing I want to say here is that we want you to engage. This is not about being passive, it's about being active. So yes, you'll be at university. The main way you talk is through seminars. So that's not just someone like me or Lorna standing at the front. That's about you being asked to do some reading, do some prep, come and discuss issues, come and engage. It's not just sitting in some big lecture theatre taking notes. That does happen occasionally, but the main way we want to learn is active learning. I'd also like to stress that through all three years there will be work placements for some short placements, some extended six weeks placements. So we're very, very keen for yes, you to learn in university, yes, for you to go to the library, yes, for you to read things, yes, for you to discuss things, but also put those things into practice out in the real world. Um, if I've said how you might learn, I suppose I ought to mention how you might be assessed. I'm thinking that some of your eyes might now, especially those students out there, be looking at the block capitals at the end that says no exams are going. OK, that is true. We don't have any exams. I would just say, though, that you, the way you are assessed is varied. So we often ask you to do essays or reports or produce an academic poster. But just because there's no exams, that doesn't mean it's easier. And actually say it's harder because you need to engage, you need to do a little and often, you need to really, you know, not just think, oh, I'll leave it till the night before. That doesn't work. So um, please, no exams, but that means, you know, there's, if anything, there's more work. Uh, OK, so where can this learn uh, lead? I think the thing I want to say here is it leads where you want it to. We 
Uh, lots of our students go on to be teachers. If you're interested in becoming a teacher in a special educational needs setting, lots of our students have gone on to do that. And this really is excellent um, provision for that. So lots of our students go on to do a PGC. Lots of our students go and teach in a mainstream, mainstream setting, a mainstream primary setting. That's because thanks to the inclusion agenda, we're very pleased that so many children that wouldn't have been in mainstream schools uh, 20 or 30 years ago are now. That's wonderful. But it's also a challenge, isn't it? Because that means we need teachers and other educational professionals that have got the skills, the ethos and the enthusiasm to make that work. You don't have to be a teacher, though. There's lots of other careers this, this can lead to. Our past students have gone on to be everything from occupational therapists to work for charities, to work in residential social works. It's really about where you want to see yourself. And I'm going to finish by saying this. For students that come to me on an open day and I ask them what they're interested in doing in the future, I always say this, look, if, you, if you're going to end up working with children, I need to tell you this, if you walk into any educational setting, they will not be sat in neat little rows, quiet, looking at you, listening, ready to learn. You will walk in and there will be a child running up and down. There'll be one child who maybe has a hearing or a visual impairment. There may be a child where English isn't their first language. There may be a child who's using a wheelchair or some other um, specialist piece of equipment. Now, I wish we could give you a, a magic wand. When I say that, a lot of them go all Harry Potter, but we can't give you a magic wand. What we can do is give you the knowledge experience and I'd like to say confidence so that you can take a deep breath in wherever you end up and say okay the child that's running up and down maybe they're on the autistic spectrum maybe if I gave them a bit of structure so they knew what was coming next maybe if I used a visual timetable you know that would help them understand what's happening next you know the child that's got a, a hearing impairment maybe I if i think about where i'm standing what the lighting's like whether they're lip reading the child where english has got an additional language i can't learn polish overnight but maybe if i learn six or seven key words that would make them feel welcomed and included the child that's using a wheelchair is there anything i can do with the layout of the room to make it accessible for them so we would love to see you again. And we would love to talk to you more, whether you come to an open day or whether you um, want to chat with us. On the final slide here uh, is that there is our emails where you can get it through Karina. Um, the most important thing is remembering that you make a difference. And I, I hope to see you again, come to Nottingham Trent University and get those skills, experience, knowledge and confidence to go out there and make a difference. Thank you so much. And 12 minutes, that wasn't too bad. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lorna and Paul. <laughs> it's been a pleasure to have you speaking. Um, it, it, it's really engaging, actually. And it's a great, such great ideas for progression for our learners out there. So it's really exciting. And yes, uh, the presentation is being recorded and therefore um, any links, etc., will be available to everyone um, and your presentations will pop in as well. So thanks very Thank much. Thank you very much for having us. Thank you. Thanks. Bye bye. Um, Jason, I am going to move swiftly on to you. Um, now, Jason is from the WAVE project and is, he runs a surf therapy programme and adaptive surfing that supports children and young people with SEND. I'm going to move it along very quickly so that we ensure that we get the best of Jason's presentation. Thank you very much. Hi, um, I hope you can hear me. Yeah, we can hear you. That's great news. OK, well, it's been fantastic to, to listen to everyone. I'm a former uh, secondary teacher who's always had a passion for uh, working with those with the most challenging behaviours, which, as we've heard, always tells us a story of an unmet need. I worked in mainly secondary schools as a senior teacher um, and became very interested in meeting the needs of those kids. Um, and always behind that was a story, a story of trauma, a story of special educational needs. And I also want to champion to all those young people listening out today that being meeting the needs of special educational needs, young people, is the best of teaching. You will learn everything that inspires you from that. If you can meet their needs, then teaching all children becomes so much easier. In the end, they teach us. They have a lot that we can learn from. 
so yeah, I'm the education manager at the Wave Project, and I'm hopefully going to share my screen. And then if I could have confirmation, you can hear a short bit of a video just to show you a little bit of what we do. Um, Okay, I should be sharing now. Can you see this video? We can. And can you confirm uh, sound as well, please? I'm in the water and on the yeah. We can. I don't feel disabled. I feel like free. I feel like everyone else who's out there in the ocean. Frankie has no mental disability. Is purely physical, so he doesn't want to surf separately. He doesn't want to do anything separately. It's not everywhere he can have that opportunity to surf safely and with people who know how to make it fun for him. Be in the water and just be able to go with the waves like that. I never in a million years expected. It's just seeing that excitement in loads of people, loads of children, loads of adults uh, who thought they would never get in the water. So it's all about inclusion and um, what we learned as a group of surfers is that our culture of having fun and including everyone is what makes a difference uh, to young people. So the WAVE project was set up uh, about 10 years ago uh, and um, it was based, uh, it was set up by Joe and uh, Joe uh, Taylor uh, wanted to help young people. And this says it all um, from a, a psychologist who came and saw our work. The WAVE project provides the therapeutic intervention for in the least clinical way possible. So we operate from a, a variety of locations over the United Kingdom, uh, in coastal areas, but we are taking our work uh, inland and to different environments. And I hope what I can share for you today is how um, our learning uh, about working in nature and our culture uh, can help young people who are struggling with mental health and well-being crises. Now, as an educator, we know there's a huge problem out there. One in six young people uh, of school age uh, are, have a probable mental health disorder, and we think that's increasing. Uh, as one in four 17 to 19 year olds are having that. We know that our young people with EHC uh, pla uh, um, plans are four times more likely to have uh, mental health disorder as well. The concentration of mental health and anxiety, as we've heard from the other speakers, is huge in those with special educational needs. We know that uh, anxiety, well-being issues are concentrated in low income backgrounds. But we also know that teachers are struggling. We haven't been trained in the past as teachers well enough to deal with well-being, mental health or special educational needs. And teachers are asking for more guidance and more help. So I hope that what we share is something that maybe you can apply um, to your settings. So we run surf therapy and what you saw there was adaptive surf therapy. Uh, anyone can surf and we take young people and adults from a huge variety of backgrounds into the water. Uh, but our main business is surf therapy, which is young people. And just for all those practitioners out there and practitioners to be, what we learned on our surf therapy courses, it's not just going surfing, it's who and how you're going surfing, it's that culture. So in the picture on the left, you can see someone dressed. I do apologize for background noise out here. Builders and gardeners uh, are operating, but I'll keep going. Um, so in the white vest is a volunteer. Each young person gets on our courses, which are free to young people and their families. And referrers are um, as school professionals, ed psychs, senkos, uh, doctors with the first social prescription. 
um, surf social prescribing surf therapy organization in the world. I'm just going back to that picture. The lady in the white vest is a volunteer. Having an emotionally available adult for a young person who's going for anxiety and well-being and often has um, a SEND challenge is massively important. And we train our volunteers to support our young people and they go on their journey. We also do surf therapy and education, which is my contribution, uh, which is beach school. And we are introducing uh, training for schools and a package and a toolkit so that schools can apply what we've learned to any biome, any natural setting, because we believe it's that combination of a challenge for young people to experience being in the outdoors, learning outdoors, the soothing effect that nature can cause and being with trained and emotionally available um, adults and other young people. Those are the factors that we've learned can make a difference. We want to share that work with um, educational uh, practitioners and anybody working with young people in the next year or two. So our theory of change is just based on what I've just said, the fun of surfing. You know, learning should be fun. And one of the things I've had the joy of doing as being the education manager is getting in the water with young people and, and particularly some of those secondary school, school young people who are suffering from anxiety and literally teaching them to play. I mean, we've got a lot of early years practitioners here and what you know about sensory involvement and what you've learned about play and guided discovery is what we actually apply to primary age and secondary school pupils and teaching them to play that. We have a culture in our theory of change of support and acceptance. There isn't any wrong. Surf things all about wiping out, wiping out, making mistakes. Well, it's just learning and exploring the sea and the outdoor environment, guided discovery. Um, and then there's a whole set of contributions that we, we can help with young people. You know, we're taking them to a new place. We know that from emerging neuroscience about blue and green therapy, that going to new places helps boost your well-being and mental health, but also meeting new people. But if you're suffering from a mental health challenge, that's not something you can do on your own. You're locked into panic, fear or a rage mode and you need help to do that. And you need a set of guided choices to help you through that process. So what we learned through surf therapy is uh, just six sessions can make a huge difference to young people and build their well-being. And what young people and their families and their professionals tell us is that those uh, that boost of their well-being to their calmness, their resilience, their confidence lasted. So that's really important to note. You know, when we deal with those affected by trauma or suffering from complex challenges, it can often be overwhelming as the practitioner to work with them. But we can make a difference, even in a small amount of time. The brain can adapt by creating calmness at a time of great challenge, by creating a sense of fun. We're opening new pathways in the brain. What we've learned in the past 10 years about neuroplasticity creates this amazing sense of hope that we can have as those working with young people. Just giving them a positive experience, even when so much of their life can be challenging and difficult or even traumatic, can just light a candle there in a brain and open new pathways. Once they felt that, they can go back to that sense of place. They can carry that memory and that and they can reinforce that. We do a lot of work about uh, from a trauma informed approach of helping young people transition from us um, onto other settings and to help them remember that. And that's also why we offer them ongoing support through our surf clubs and our community. So I mentioned there a little bit about what we're doing. So up on the left is um, a section from Pan's Keep. People suffering from mental health or in those um, fear, panic and rage uh, moments. What we've done in our education programmes is we've designed what, again, early uh, year settings do a lot of, is we get our young people seeking, caring and playing. So we design activities that engage that, that try and draw them out of themselves literally. Of course, we use um, lots of pace, lots of protection, reflection, regulation with them. And that's about that emotional attachment that we're helping them build. When we're in the water, that young person has a choice. They may not be swimmers. As you saw in the video, some may be people who can't swim. They're, they're physically unable to or even blind. We take blind uh, young people and adults surfing too. 
that creates this tremendous sense of trust and calmness as the water does in that sensory environment and that helps us build a relationship with that young person and for us as educators to help take them on a learning journey as well but it's really important never to underestimate the importance of challenge challenge at their level starting where they are and guiding them forward is really important and then we're a great believer from the outdoor industry that you know learning outside surfing or other outdoor sports can help people grow and we try and very carefully keep them in the growth zone pushing them into the growth zone but not into the panic zone and yes yeah, sometimes that happens and sometimes they wipe out in the water but then they learn how to regulate themselves but they're with people who can support them they learn to breathe they learn to calm themselves so I thought I'd share my first experience uh, working as an education manager I've been invited into a, a special school uh, in Cornwall and you know some special schools because the variety of young people they deal with have a lot of locked doors eventually I've got in shown my ID I passed through four locked doors and, and I ended up with uh, this young person here with him was a head teacher and three other staff so he just arrived in the school as we've heard it can often take a long time to diagnose somebody uh, with an unmet special educational needs need and the school was at a, uh, a loss they'd worked with us before they were unsure this young person had multiple personality disorders possible ASD ADHD they didn't know but what they did know that young person could not regulate when around other young people and in fact was showing a variety of negative behaviors so they looked to us to help reset that young person to boost their well-being they like us believe that actually sometimes focusing on character development and social emotional security you know going right back down to the bottom of the principles of achievement providing a safe place and a calmness for that young person is the first building step for us to help them improve their learning so we took the young person to the water and you sometimes see this with young people who've never been to the beach before first this is a huge sensory overwhelm for them and on the top right the young person has arrived on the beach a nine-year-old and he's literally eating the peach now after he'd stopped doing that and we focused him on some other areas we got him down to the water um, and at first there's this sense of needing to um, keep us very close looking for attachment uh, in the water and you can see me trying to attune there and regulate getting down to the same level as the young person uh, and attuning, seeing what they're experiencing. There's lots of salt in my eyes, you can see in the middle picture. And again, we've got sensory overwhelm. But, you know, we're experiencing this together. It's okay. We've got curiosity about the young person's emotional and physical state, and they're talking to us. And then gradually throughout this course, uh, the young person from going from being right next to us and not going further into the water, uh, push their own comfort zone, would go further away from us and um, not too far because they weren't a confident swimmer or surfer um, but they were able to push themselves into that environment now at first this young person was completely overwhelmed with us but over those six sessions just six sessions we saw a remarkable change in them eventually they learned to surf but they also learned to communicate with us they went from trying to control everything um, and not wanting to follow instructions lots of signs of sort of positive demand avoidance but those guided choices we gave um, helped them begin to take steps forward on their own and that built their confidence they learned to stand up on a surfboard they learned to wipe out they learned to experience a little bit of fear but in a safe way and um, they began to communicate much more with us and at the end of this young course having told us lots of imaginary stories of the people that you know he lived with he almost let his guard down and he got up and he thanked us for what we did and then he put his car back on made up an imaginary story said i'm off to see my um my family in australia with their 500 unicorns but he led us in for a moment and he did say thank you he went back to the special school and he's now working with other young people so we helped to contribute with a timely intervention at a time of need so we offer in education a beach school which is a group course and you can see on the left hand side some of the activities we do we don't just surf we do those seeking activities with a rock pool ramble guided discovery 
and we have the joy of working in small numbers, which is really important for our most vulnerable young people. So in this one, it's two adults, two trained adults, teacher and surf instructor, both lifeguards, to eight young people. So in that Rockpool Ramble, that natural exploration of what's this, what's this anemone, it leads to questions. curriculum um, we have learning objectives you know we've got good old-fashioned levels and where we're trying to take those young people but because it's small numbers we can adapt it right around the child we can weave the learning through their questions and our guided discovery and up at the top left you know we study Cornish sand artists and we go out there and do the art so this sensory experience and this guided discovery is helping reset young people but we're also trying to give them some techniques in the education area to help them learn to regulate. And then what you saw the earlier story uh, is our surf back to school. And here we're dealing with the most vulnerable young people we have, often looked after young people, often at risk of exclusion, homeschooled. Um, we sometimes go down to about seven or so or extreme anxiety. Um, and here we work two to one typically, two trained professionals to one young person. So an intensive boost for them. And one of the things I've learned um, through working with these young people is often there's this typology of behaviours that, that some of those behaviours you see in high anxiety are very similar to some of the behaviours you see with some types of autism or ADHD. And in fact, it's this process of being there for them. We're not a talking therapy. We don't uh, um, talk about uh, you know use cognitive behavior therapy we provide them with a positive experience of play a safe space a fun space in their week a time of optimism and hope for them to look forward to but we also take them on a challenge and we take them learning and we found that this approach does work for both uh, young people uh, both those with anxiety and those with high levels of needs when we set up or joe set up the wave project we work with the NHS Innovation Unit here in Cornwall and they put evaluation at the heart of what we do and we put used a well-known wellbeing scale to help us evaluate our impact on the young people and you can see here um, you know based on hundreds of young people that our impact on resilience self-esteem and confidence is huge and that's just six sessions and again back to our practitioners of the future never underestimate the importance of just that focused moment you can have with young people it can create something over time that leads to positive change in them i'd like to uh finish by just um sharing what we are bringing to um schools uh and perhaps Trent University <laughs> in, in the next year or so. We're working uh, with NCFE to produce a level qualification. What we've learned is that working in the green and the blue and this emerging science of adventure therapy and green and blue therapy, being in nature, learning outside um, can have an immense impact on young people. So we are creating wave rangers leaders where young people will go out of school, really important, out of school, into their community, really important, just like at the wave project, you know, to a new place, meeting new people, doing a challenge. It helps activate personal development. It's evidence-based nature therapy. We were independently evaluated by Sport England. And our young people in wave rangers, again, in six sessions, work in nature and they uh, are engaged in a conservation project in their local environment. This could be citizen science, it could be active conversation, removing invasive species, it could be raising awareness through our installations. So to sum up, what we've learnt is that nature helps. Immerse our young people with sensory issues, with send issues, with well-being and mental health challenges, immerse them in nature and by that let them be in nature but you have to enable that you can't just put a young person outside and they suddenly start meditating we have to help them to that place help them connect to trusted emotionally available adults and other young people to the group they're working with create that culture that culture of play and fun and acceptance activate them engage them in a challenge in surf therapy where we learned um, our, our main business 
it's the process of surfing, but we've applied it to stand up paddle boarding. There are now charities who've learned from us who've applied the same culture for adults, but also in other contexts, for example, in climbing therapy and so on. Finally, what we have learned is that this empowers young people to believe that they can change, that they can make a difference uh, to themselves and make a difference to their environment. So I'd like to end there. And, and hope I've told you a, a little bit uh, about what we do at the WAVE project and perhaps helped you to reflect on how um, you could apply that to your own setting. Jason, that was fantastic. Thank you so much. I've thoroughly enjoyed your presentation. It has, oh, there's so many thoughts in my head about how this could be used and how our practitioners will I use it. Any sound back, so did you hear me? <laughs> yes, we did hear you. We heard you all the way through. Thank you. Um, so yes, thank you very much. Uh, a brilliant, brilliant presentation. Loads to think about. Um, and I'm going to pass over to Janet. So Janet will um, just round off for us this afternoon. Thank you. Should I say the end? <laughs> <laughs> yes, you can. <laughs> Is there anyone summing up after me? Do you want me to sing a song? Do some surfing? <laughs> surfing, surfing would be good. Can't hear you, Janet. Oh, can't you? Can nobody hear me? I can hear you. Oh, okay. I can unless hear. You, um, unless you wanted to me to be be singing something around the surfing. But what I wanted to do is thank, just really give a shout out there to all the speakers. Absolutely amazing afternoon. Um. And I think I've written, I was so busy listening, but I think I've written everybody down or can remember everybody. So to Katie, to Catherine, Amanda, to Pilar, Gillian, Lorna, Paul, um, and Jason. Have I missed anybody out? Andrea. I don't think I've missed anybody out. And of course, to our wonderful students, um, Sarah and Lauren, what an amazing afternoon packed with so much information. So just wanted to say thank you so, so much um, and for everything that you bring to NCFE Cash and, and to the learners. Thank you so much. It would We just wouldn't be able to do this without you and the students are so inspired by what they can do next and to actually have that value and that appreciation of the difference that they make every single day. So yeah, thank you everybody and we hope to see you all soon. Thanks, Karina, and to all of the internal colleagues on the call. Thank you. Thanks very much.